Welcome back everyone to another Tech Breakdown video where today we're going to take a trip down memory lane and dissect the PlayStation 4 GPU codenamed Liverpool. The PlayStation 4 had a lot of attention back in 2013, not only being more affordable at launch than its competitor, the Xbox One, but also had a much larger GPU with a lot more memory bandwidth as well. So today we're going to break down the specs of the PS4 and hone in on its GPU and RAM configuration to see exactly why it had these advantages. But if you're new to the channel and enjoy tech breakdowns make sure to subscribe to catch my weekly videos and if you like this video at all make sure to blast the like button that way youtube will actually show it to other people who enjoy it as well i really appreciate you all now let's just dive right into it before we dive into any of the details on the gpu let's break down the overall specs of the playstation 4 which paints a clear picture to where performance capabilities were focused on during its design. Powering the PS4 was a custom AMD APU, sharing the same Liverpool codename as the GPU. An APU is an accelerated processing unit, which AMD uses as a term for a chip that combines a CPU and GPU on one single die. This APU specifically contains the PS4's AMD Jaguar CPU and its AMD Radeon GPU, and was built on a 28 nanometer process node. The CPU had eight of these x86 Jaguar core and ran at a 1.6 gigahertz clock speed. Now coming from 3.2 gigahertz in the PS3 and Xbox 360 CPUs, this was the first hint that CPU performance wasn't on track to be the best throughout the generation, even with major IPC improvements made between CPU generations. The Jaguar was also designed with a mobile first focus, primarily to be used with laptops and low powered desktops. So between that clock speed and the origination of where the Jaguar cores came from, and their focus on sacrificing raw performance for less power and therefore heat generation, you can already see why gamers trashed on prior generation console CPUs for their poor performance capabilities and the common bottleneck that they caused, often seen especially later in the generation. The PS4 also came with 8GB of GDDR5 RAM with a 178GB a second bandwidth. The memory configuration of the PS4 was not only impressive, but way ahead of its competition, which we will dive into. In fact, as we move away from the CPU and break down the GPU, and already just bringing up the RAM, we can see that the PS4 was a GPU and graphics first machine. The Radeon GPU in the PS4 was based on AMD's GCN 1.1 architecture and ran at a 800MHz clock speed. Speed. It came equipped with 18 compute units, each with 64 stream processors for a total of 1152 stream processors altogether. These processors are also called shader cores, and they all handle small chunks of data in parallel. These over 1100 stream processors work all at once to crunch the numbers for the shaders, physics, lighting, particles, and everything that is needed in order to render high fidelity graphics, so obviously the more the better. It also had 72 texture mapping units, which fetch texture data, like images, then filter it, and then apply it to a 3D model, aka texture mapping, mip mapping, and filtering. It also had 32 ROPs, which take all the finished texture data and shaded pixels and write them to the frame buffer, or your screen. They do all the pixel blending, depth testing, and can even help with anti-aliasing. The PS4 GPU also had eight AC CEs, or asynchronous compute engines, which isn't as often talked about, and could support up to 64 queues at once. These engines let the PS4's GPU run multiple tasks at the same time without waiting for each task to finish first. An example is like being able to do shadows and lighting while also queuing up post-processing at the same time. The ACEs also help the GPU by allowing it to draw and run physics instead of just having the CPU take care of all those calculations, negating any potential CPU bottlenecks, which as we discussed was essentially necessary because because of the low power and weak Jaguar CPU cores. These GPU specs gave the PS4 the ability of having 25.6 gigapixels per second for a pixel fill rate, 57.6 gigapixels per second for a texture fill rate, and had 1.84 teraflops of compute power. To back up the capabilities and the hardware in the beefy GPU in the PS4, the memory configuration also helped PS4 GPU soar. Again, the aforementioned particularly impressive 8 gigabytes of GDDR5 memory running on a 256-bit memory bus. This provided that massive 100. 76 gigabytes a second of memory bandwidth, and for perspective, a lower mid-tier PC GPU at the time, the, the Radeon R9 270, had 179 gigabytes a second of memory bandwidth, and the PS4's competitor, the Xbox One, had just 68.3 gigabytes a second. This was a huge deal, especially when you consider that the PS4 sold for a 399 MSRP in the United States when it launched, which was a competitive price for a complete system that could play games in and of itself when compared to higher-end PC.
PCs and their GPUs at their standalone prices, and of course the $100 more expensive and technically inferior Xbox One. And talking about that technical inferiority, we can compare the Xbox One and the PS4 specs and get an idea of exactly why the Xbox One had a disadvantage in almost every single title. The Xbox One had the same 8-core Jaguar CPU, but it operated at 1.75 gigahertz, 150 megahertz faster than the PS4. In CPU heavy games, this did give the Xbox One an advantage, with Assassin's Creed Unity being a good example here where it was able to achieve higher frame rates than the PS4 due to the CPU. Now as for RAM, the configuration used in the Xbox One was, was definitely its Achilles heel, featuring the same 8 gigabyte capacity but using much slower DDR3 RAM chips and it had a total of 68.3 gigabytes a second of memory bandwidth. It also had 32 megabytes of embedded memory called ESRAM that I talk about a lot more in detail in my Xbox One video I covered a few weeks back, but even at 204 gigabytes a second, this ES RAM wasn't enough to compensate for this Delta that the much larger 8 gigabyte memory pool had when it came to its memory bandwidth. On top of this, the PlayStation 4's operating system only used one gigabyte of RAM, so seven gigabytes total were available for games, where the Xbox One had a much heavier operating system and was said to use as much as three gigabytes of RAM for its operating system and other kernels. So on top of much faster memory, the PS4 had two more gigabytes of actual usable RAM for its games. Its GPU was also based on the GCN 1.1 architecture, but it was a much smaller GPU compared to the PS4s, with just 12 compute units for a total of 768 shaders, but operated at a faster 853 MHz to narrow that gap just a little bit more. The Xbox One GPU also had a naturally lower TMU count due to having less CUs and sat at 48 total. It also had half of the ROPs at 16 and only had two ACEs, and they could only queue up to eight queues in total altogether. Now on paper, between the RAM, the raw GPU specs, the PS4 looked like it could blow the Xbox One out of the water in a lot of ways. I mean, its GPU had double the ROPs, four times the ACEs, about 50% more TMUs and raw teraflop compute power, with almost three times the memory bandwidth and even more usable RAM for its games. And when you look at these specs and take that into consideration, it should have made a huge difference in almost every single third-party game. But it honestly didn't seem like that was all the case, with the rule of thumb being games would just simply render at native 1080p or maybe 900p on the PS4 and 900p or 720p respectively on the Xbox One. Now there is certainly some truth to that performance premium with some games where there are noticeable differences beyond resolution. The example being Tomb Raider Definitive Edition, which ran at a lower 900p on the Xbox One and locked its frame rate to 30 FPS and even then still suffered from some dips, where the PS4 ran the game at native 1080p and had up to 60 frames per second capability while also having some higher textures and better anisotrophic filtering as well. And that had me really thinking and so I started digging into this as much as possible and why we didn't see more of a common or larger difference between the two consoles graphically. And it seems to really just come down to fine tuning and finishing touch optimizations most of the time or I should say the lack thereof. You see resolutions are the lowest hanging fruit in the optimization process and what I mean by that is let's say you want better textures, less aliasing, and more details in distant objects over what the lowest end console and the lowest common denominator you've already probably optimized the most for to get running as good as possible, all without doing much more work, assuming that the other system or systems have a lot more graphics and memory overhead, just simply bump the resolution up and mission is accomplished. Your game now looks sharper overall, boosting fidelity in several areas naturally as a result and byproduct, all while your performance may still be just as stable, if not more. So there you go. Time is saved and time is money. Now, this wasn't always the case. Again, there are plenty of examples where third party titles ran at higher resolutions, better performance, and may even had better graphics options on the PS4 than the Xbox One. But the rule of thumb was simple with resolution differences and performance differences being the most common. But first party titles that fully utilize the PS4's hardware capability to the maximum, as any example with any platform, is going to of course provide the best examples of what that system can do. And when developers utilized all of the hardware in the PlayStation 4, especially those AACEs, it was able to produce graphics that exceed expectations and still hold up extremely well today. One of which being Uncharted 4, which I freaking love that game. But that's all I have for you in today's video. The newer consoles are pretty straightforward in hardware spec and architecture as they are essentially using computer components nowadays versus more custom 
optimization with hardware components like in older console generations prior where you have to learn about so much just to be able to make it into digestible content. But it's still fun and interesting to learn about, at least I think so. I hope you all enjoyed the video and please comment your favorite memories down below about the PlayStation 4 if you have them. I'd love to hear them. And I hope to see my Ramble Squad sounding off in the comments so I can reach out to you and thank you all personally as I always do. I will see you all in next week's video. Until then, I hope you have a great morning, afternoon, or evening. Peace.